Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar titled Immunoprotective versus Immunopathogenic Responses during fungal-associated allergic airway inflammation. The webinar is a part of the Microbiology Virtual Week virtual event. Now, um, I am Sabrina Lemus of LabRoots, and I will be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Luminex. For more information about Luminex, go to www.luminexcorp.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive and we encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you would like during the presentation. To do so, to simply type them into the ask a question box and click send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and thus offers free continuing education credits. Click on the Continuing Education Credits tab located on the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speaker, Dr. Chad Steele, Professor, excuse me, Professor and Chair, Department of Microbiology and Immunology at Tulane University. For a complete biography on our speaker, please visit the bio biography tab at the top of your screen. Dr. Steele, welcome. You may now begin your presentation. Okay, thank you, Sabrina. Um, so uh, good afternoon or, or good morning, depending on where you are, everybody. Um, so Sabrina said, I have this presentation today, immunoprotective versus immunopathogenic responses during fungal associated allergic airway inflammation are also known as simply fungal asthma. Um, I want to first thank Luminex for uh, sponsoring this presentation and also to Tyler and to Sabrina from LabRoots for all their help in hosting the, uh, this uh, workshop. So uh, I first want to start off and just kind of, you know, give you some, some definitions of what we talk about when we talk about asthma. It's actually a very simple disease in terms of explanation, but obviously it's much more complex than what this slide is gonna show. What it simply is, is inflammation in the airways that leads to a decline in lung function. And so what you have here in this cartoon is a picture of an airway, a healthy airway or normal airways on the left. Uh, and then you have a disease or, or, or an airway undergoing an asthmatic attack on the far right. And you can see how the lumen of that airway is much smaller. It's been um, you know, inflamed. Uh, it's uh, it's got mucus in it, things like that, and then that's that's how we have a uh, have a have a uh, a defect in our in our pulmonary function when our airways get like that. Uh, how many people have it? So in the U.S., it's about 25 million people, so roughly uh, one in 12. This includes adults and kids. About 300 million worldwide. And then from the standpoint of a healthcare cost, it's actually quite significant. About 82 billion a year in the U.S. alone. That essentially rivals cancer healthcare costs uh, in the U.S. as well. Um, so when we talk about asthma, we talk about two main things, a phenotype of asthma and an endotype of asthma. So a phenotype is really, you know, a, an observable combination of uh, these various clinical, biological, physi physiological uh, characteristics. Uh, you can see here that um, you have adult onset asthma, you have childhood asthma, uh, a big component of asthma, probably two thirds of asthma is considered allergic asthma, where you have allergies to a variety of different things, such as, you know, cats or dogs or trees or pollen. Uh, obviously, in this case, we're talking about uh, individuals who are allergic to fungi. Uh, and then a, a lot of other different types of asthma, you know, infection-related, air pollution, you have exercise-induced asthma. These are all basically common phenotypes of asthma. But then you have to get to the even more detailed when you talk about the endotypes. And the endotypes is really the actual mechanism that contributes to your disease pathogenesis. And so you can see over here, on the right, early onset, allergic asthma is often mediated by the antibody IgE. Uh, it's also mediated by the type 2 or T helper 2 cytokines, such as IL-4 and IL-13, IL-5. You can have eosinophilic asthma. You can have neutrophilic asthma. There's a lot of different types. And the reason why it's important to understand endotypes and why we uh, you know, you know, segment asthma out into these is that studying of endotypes is actually uh, brought about you know, some of the most promising therapeutics we have for treating asthma. You can see on this slide over there on the uh, 
on the left in the red boxes, these are all the type two cytokines and the type two immune responses associated with IgE generation. And we have a lot, quite a few biologics or, or anti-cytokine or anti-cytokine receptor antibodies that have a, have a huge effect on the severity of disease and, and, and can ameliorate much of the symptoms and the exacerbations that are associated with asthma. Some newer ones that are coming on board that are in clinical trials now include the ones in the middle, uh, you know, things that target TSLP or IL-33 or IL-25. These are pro-allergic, pro-type 2 uh, inducing cytokines that, that drive uh, these type 2 and TH2 responses. But the caveat is, is that this is the pathway, while very well represented in asthma, and is, is clearly a causative pathway in disease severity and, 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 and pathogenesis. Um, most of these biologic, at least everyone on this page, really only targets that type 2 TH2 response. And so obviously some asthma is not type 2 or TH2. It could be interfering gamma driven or type 1 TH1 driven. It could be IL-17 driven, type 17 or TH17 driven. And so, you know, we have to really drill down into individual asthmatic endotypes to figure out what component is driving that response and can it be targeted. And so that's really kind of been some of the goals of our research over the last uh, eight to 10 years. So when we talk about what we're specifically investigating in the lab, it's really allergic asthma as it relates to fungal sensitization. So this has a variety of terms in the literature. Severe asthma with fungal sensitization is one term. Fungal asthma is another term, fungal associated air allergic airway inflammation. And what you can see here on the left is really uh, kind of the standard uh, uh, blood test that you would run in an allergist office or an immunologist office clinically. This is the panel that we would look at from the standpoint of what you're allergic to is, so we can kind of figure out, you know, what your triggers are, you know, and things like that. And you can see in the red boxes, I have three fungi uh, that are very common in asthma pathogenesis and in asthma allergy um, that, we, that we routinely test for. Uh, one of those being Aspergillus fumigatus, which is the organism that I've worked on for about 15 years uh, and the one we're gonna be talking about today. So if you're an asthmatic and you're sensitized to um, a fungi, Aspergillus or Altenaria or Clonosporium or Penicillium, uh, what does that mean? Well, oftentimes you have a poorly controlled asthma um, you know, it, it, you know, from the most severe asthmatics, it ranges anywhere from 15 to 45 percent. It's usually uh, younger onset of disease, so childhood. Uh, your IgE levels are often higher than it is for other sensitivities, other allergen sensitivities. You usually use steroids much more often, and you also have more exacerbations and more hospitalizations. Now, it's rare to see an individual that's only allergic to fungi. You're usually allergic to a lot of these different things. You can be allergic to anywhere of six, eight, or 10 of these at, at, at one time. But there are some that appear to be more dominant, dominant than others. Um, and a lot of times when we look at our data, we do look at asthmatics that are allergic to some things, but just not aspergillus or alternaria. And then we compare those to asthmatics that are allergic to all these different things, as well as the various uh, fungi. So this is, was really our first foray into asthma, at least experimentally. Um, we developed an animal model um, where we take aspergillus. This is, uh, you know, the, it's the black mold you see in your ceiling tile, you know, things like that. Um, it's ubiquitous in the environment. It's in, uh, you know, your carpet, you know, it's in the ceiling tile, you know, things like that. You breathe it in every day and nobody really has any problems with it. But if you do uh, get some level of reactivity to it, obviously a sensitivity with high Ig type 2 cytokines, things like that, you could result in this reactive airway disease. And so we don't use any, um, any allergens. We actually use the live fungal organism because that's what you breathe in every day. We, um, we also don't use any adjuvants to skew the immune response one way or the other. We just, uh, just really just uh, treat the mice or, or challenge the mice with the organism. So that's our, our, um, our, our, um, our timeline there where we basically give a dose at day zero, we wait a week, and then we challenge five days in a row, wait a couple of days, three more times, and then we sacrifice animals uh, in this case, mice on day 17, and that's when we do all of our inflammatory and physiological uh, measurements. And so, as I said, this was the first study that we did uh, going on eight years ago now. Um, we were interested in this, uh, this pattern recognition receptor called Dectin-1, which is a fungal beta-glucan receptor. And we basically had published previously that in an, in, in an infection model, this receptor was required for clearing the organism from the lung and required for... Um, all the inflammatory responses and things like that. But in asthma, it's actually bad. So signaling through Dectin-1 during a chronic exposure, um, 
results in uh, worse lung function, which you can see at the top right graph. Um, and um, you can see that other components that are detectable independent include the the, uh, the text in blue, the buck 5 ac uh, uh, goblet um, expression, uh, chemoconscious of CCL17, CCL22, which are critical for uh, recruiting type 2 cells from the lung, IL-33, some inflammatory mediators such as IL-1 beta and, and CCL1, as well as uh, uh, neutrophil. All of that was dependent on detectin-1. <coughs> Excuse me. And we also ultimately uh, ascribe this to, to the cytokine IL-22, which is an IL-10 family member. It's part of the type 17 responses with IL-17A. And essentially, mice that were deficient in IL-22 phenocopied the DEC-1 knockouts and uh, incidentally provided us a therapeutic target. And so if you see the bottom graph there, you can see that when we treat mice with an antibody against IL-22, we can uh, modulate the severity of their asthma as measured by uh, uh, lung function. So this was our initial foray into uh, experimental asthma. And one question that we had, you know, a year or so after this paper was published was, you know, can we get insight from human patients? So human asthmatics that are sensitized to fungi, can they tell us something about their disease that we can, you know, bring back to our animal model and interrogate some pathways and mediators and things like that um, that could be contributing to the severity of asthma? And so we reached out to a group at uh, Wake Forest who was part of the uh, this uh, Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute Severe Asthma Research Program. This was a program that was funded for quite a few years uh, between 2000 and 2017. It was multiple sites around the U.S., uh, and they enrolled uh, quite a few asthmatics um, and phenotyped these individuals. And so ultimately, about 35% of these asthmatics had uh, had some um, positivity or some sensitizations of specific IgE or skin test reactivity to fungi. You can see in this table here, this is comparing uh, some of these asthmatics that were that were allergic asthmatics or atopic asthmatics, but were not fungal positives. So that's the fungal negative category versus those that were actually sensitized to fungi. You can see in the bold area that uh, in a nutshell, if you were fungal sensitized or you're fungal positive, you have worse lung function. Um, you have higher levels of, of, of atopy or, or allergicness. So your IgE levels are higher. You have higher eosinophils in your blood. Um, things like that, and so for all intents and purposes, uh, the, the, if you're fungal, if you're an asthmatic that's fungal sensitized, your asthma appears to be somewhat worse uh, by by all these different parameters. And so the question we ask is, can we, you know, uh, you know, look into these uh, individuals and look at some samples derived from the lung, uh, and 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 basically identify potential you know, uh, biomarkers or mediators that are upregulated or, or, or expressed or produced at higher amounts uh, in these patients, and then bring those back to our animal model and see if we can interrogate their role. So in our initial uh, runs several years ago, we looked at uh, bronchoalveolar lavage fluid from these patients, and we also looked at induced sputum from these patients. And you can see um, we did this by the, uh, by the Luminex um, reagent. So this is the cytokine beta ray, uh, the multiplex system, um, our machine is from, from Byrad, the Bioplex system, and the kits we used in this case were from uh, Milliport or the Milliplex kits. So these are the human panels that we use that comprise 96 different analytes uh, that we can quantify at the uh, protein level. And so we did that, and uh, I'm going to break down quite a few of these that we actually have now pursued. This is research, like I said, that's been going on probably for six or seven years now. This is uh, some data that we published about two years ago, looking at some of the differences and some of the mediators that were um, that are different between fungal positive and fungal negative. Uh, these are all uh, mediators that we found to be significantly elevated in the uh, human asthmatics that were uh, that were sensitized to to the variety of uh, fungi. The one I have uh, highlighted here is IL-7. So IL-7 is a um, common gamma chain. Uh, cytokine, uh, very critical for lymphocyte development, um, things of that nature. And we were actually interested in IL-7, uh, or we were actually, you know, we, we had an interest in IL-7 actually even before we found it in asthma because we had an interest in, in from our previous Dectin-1 IL-22 paper, we had an interest in trying to determine what cells were actually making IL-22 in the lung during fungal asthma. And at that time, we had some preliminary data uh, that suggested that it was some of the innate like lymphocytes, the gamma delta T cells, the INK T cells, uh, those cells. And it turns out that those cells uh, require IL-7 for homeostasis and things of that nature. So it was interesting that IL-7 came up on our initial um, you know, biomarker assessment 
in these uh, in these human asthmatics. And so essentially what we showed, so this is basically the raw data on the left showing the IL-7 is elevated in these fungal positive patients. And one thing that we were able to do with this particular cytokine was to show that it actually had this, this negative correlation with this PC-20. So PC-20 is a lung function measurement uh, that is the concentration that it's required um, a methacholine to, that's required to produce a 20% drop in, in FEV1, which is another measure of lung function, forced expiratory volume. And as you can see on this, in the second graph down at the bottom there, that as the IL-7 uh, cytokine concentration increases, uh, the, the log PC-20 or the less drug it takes to provoke this 20% drop. And so it will suggest that IL-7 is potentially having some type of uh, uh, adverse or, or, or pathogenic role um, in, in fungal asthma. And so we basically hypothesized from this that um, that these high IL-7 or higher IL-7 levels in these fungal positive asthmatics may drive some type of homeostatic or expansion of cell populations um, that produce some factors. And these factors ultimately uh, cause um, uh, asthma to, to exacerbate or to worsen uh, in some way. And so initially we, uh, we thought about tackling this by, um, by looking at animals that, that did, not, did not make IL-7, so an IL-7 deficient mouse or an IL-7 knockout. It turns out those mice really can't get asthma because they have a significant defect in their lymphocyte population. So essentially a lot of the cells that cause asthma um, are, are, are absent or, or significantly lower amounts in, in those mice. And so that's not really the, the right way to go. We also thought, thought about taking the biologic um, angle and, and neutralizing IL-7. And we uh, actually can't do that because uh, one of the interesting characteristics of the common gamut chain family is that if you actually neutralize them with an antibody, you actually extend their half-life and make them more potent rather than blocking them, which is something we actually found the hard way by treating mice with IL-7 or anti-IL-7 and making it worse. And so what we ultimately did is that we ultimately decided, let's just try to elevate the level of IL-7 during experimental fungal asthma and see what that would do. And so we ended up treating mice with IL-7. And essentially, we um, used the exact same model that we had before. This is data that we published a couple of years ago. Uh, and basically, if you give IL-7 to mice over the development of our fungal asthma model, uh, their lung function gets, gets much, much worse. Uh, it drives um, uh, high levels of type 2 cytokines, some of the pro-allergic chemokines that I mentioned earlier, CCL-17, CCL-22. A lot of the inflammatory cytokines go up. Um, IL-17, IL-22 go up. Uh, you know, increases in cellularity, so CD4 T cells, eosinophils, things of that nature. This is the data that I had referred to earlier, looking at what cells were making IL-22. So this is an IL-22 reporter mouse, uh, flow cytometry here on the right. And basically the quantified data is, this is control would be um, basically mice that received uh, vehicle or PBS, and then FA is fungal asthma. And you can see how uh, the NK T cells and the gamma delta T cells um, in the CD4 is actually kind of expand and this model, and then down at the bottom, is actually uh, both sets of mice that are that are both fungal asthma, but one's treated with vehicle and one's treated with recombinant IL-7. And you can see how the NKT cells uh, are dramatically increased as well as the CD4 cells. And so, like I said, these mice get um, much more severe asthma. Um, we did try to target this from a therapeutic standpoint. As I said, we can't do anti-IL-7 as a therapy but we could potentially block the receptor as a therapeutic. And so we did try to block uh, CD127, which is the IL-7 receptor. We were to mod we were to we were able to modulate the, the, the immune response a little bit in these mice. We could lower the type two responses. We could lower the type 17 responses. Cellularity also was modulatable by anti-CD127 uh, treatment. But what was really interesting and un unexpected was we actually made the lung function worse. Even though the immunology per se got better, uh, AHR or airway hyperreactivity um, or airway resistance got worse. And we still to this day don't necessarily know why that happened. It was actually a very consistent observation and it's something that we're, uh, that we're still pursuing and trying to understand why blocking that signaling pathway for IL-7 uh, ended, up, uh, ended up having a decrement in, in, in lung physiology. So another couple of uh, mediators that fell out of our analysis initially in our human asthmatics was IL-1 beta and IL-1 RA or IL-1 receptor antagonist, which is the natural uh, antagonist for IL-1 alpha and IL-1 beta uh, signaling. These were both found to be elevated uh, in, our, um, in our human fungal positive asthmatics. And so this is the paper that we published uh, just under a year ago, looking at 
the role of these. And so we looked at mice that were deficient in the IL-1 receptor. And as you can see on the left, the graphs, these mice actually have uh, much improved asthma. This, this is airway resistance, airway hyperactivity on the top. The bottom graph is, is another aspect of really whole lung or total lung resistance, the dynamic lung resistance. And you can see that the, uh, that the knockout mice that don't have the IL-1 receptor actually do much better. Um, and histologically, you have um, basically an H&E on top and a PAS stain that stains mucus on the bottom. And you can see in the wild type mouse, mice, at least around the airways, you see a fair amount of inflammation that you don't really see in the IL-1 receptor knockouts. And then also in the wild types, you see, um, you know, really evidence of asthma with the, the, the purple or the, the, the hot pink staining in the airway, which is the mucus and the goblet cells and things like that that are really hyperactive. And you see that at a much, much lower level in the, um, in the IL-1 receptor uh, knockout mice. So it appears that signaling through the IL-1 receptor does contribute to pathogenesis and severity of, um, of fungal asthma. Now, what happens if you remove the antagonist? And so if you take mice that are deficient in the natural inhibitor of IL-1 signaling, IL-1 receptor antagonist, you see the complete opposite phenotype. These mice get much worse asthma. They get uh, the AHR, so the airway resistance is, is much higher in these animals. The total lung resistance is much higher. And if you look at it histologically, it, it, you could, it doesn't take a pathologist to see that these lungs are not looking too good. So H&E again on the top, PAS thing lungs on the bottom, um, what you end up seeing for the most part in these IL-1 receptor antagonist knockouts um, is really this massive inflammatory response and, and almost an, an, an obliterative lung injury phenotype. It almost looks like pneumonia. I mean, this is a lot of inflammation. The airways are, are completely clogged, almost to the point where you can't even see the, um, you know, the, the hyperplasia or the mucus production and everything. Just the airways are just full of, of all these inflammatory cells. And so we have this really interesting polar opposite phenotype between the IL-1 receptor knockouts and IL-1 receptor antagonist knockouts. And so that left us prompt to really kind of go after what the immunological you know, mechanisms or consequences were uh, in these mice. And so the first thing we looked at was you have to pretty much look at type 2 or TH2 responses and eosinophil um, levels and things like that. That's the classic you know, asthma pathogenesis. Um, um, pathways you can see in the receptors knockouts on the left and the and the receptor antagonist knockouts on the right. Uh, on the left, you see that actually the receptor um, knockouts who have much improved asthma or less severe asthma have lower eosinophils. Uh, the type two responses were actually relatively low. Um, this model uh, actually we published before that it really induces everything. So type one, type two, type seventeen, all these responses are induced and. I would argue you could probably uh, individually neutralize any one of those pathways and, and get some level of efficacy um, as far as uh, improving disease. But uh, our bias is that it's really IL-17 and IL-22 that's the most immunopathogenic in this model. But you know, again, we have to look at type two just to just to determine you know what the effects are on these pathways. Um, you would expect that the receptor antagonists, because their lungs look really really inflamed. Uh, and because their airway hyperactivity and their lung function was really, really poor, everything would be kind of through the roof, if you will, at least from the type 2 standpoint. We actually don't see that. Um, the eosinophils were actually lower. They weren't higher, which we would probably expect. Um, some of the pro-allergic chemokines were either no different or slightly higher. Um, the TH2 cytokines, at least for IL-4 and IL-5, were not exacerbated. They were actually lower. Now, IL-33 was... Um, was a little bit higher in these in these mice. Again, that that did not correlate with the um, the, uh, the the IL four and IL five levels, but you know it is considered you know an effector and a pro allergic uh, mediator, and so um, so that was elevated. But in general, the type two responses uh, were not were not elevated in these receptor antagonists. What was interesting is that we saw the complete uh, you know mirror image or the flip flop, if you will, of the type seventeen responses. So once again, the IL one receptor knockouts on the left, the receptor antagonist knockouts on the right. And you can see that um, that the neutrophil levels were cut by half, at least, in the receptor knockouts. Uh, the type 17 cytokines, IL-17 and IL-22, were significantly reduced, and um, as well as some of the 17-dependent um, mediators, such as GCSF, that was also, um, you know, which is a growth factor for neutrophils, um, that was also significantly reduced. In contrast, in the receptor antagonists, this actually would what we would probably expect from the standpoint of looking at the histology. 
You can see the neutrophils were dramatically increased. Uh, IL-17, IL-22 was not, but IL-17 was also increased by fourfold. And the chemokines uh, in GCSF that are associated with neutrophil development, neutrophil chemotaxis, um, were also elevated in these uh, in these animals. And so now we're starting to get a little bit clearer picture of of some of the immunopathogenic mechanisms that are that are affecting fungal asthma in the sense that you know it, it appears that it could be neutrophil driven and IL-17 associated as well. Um, we also looked at type one responses. This is just uh, again, this is actually using. Luminex technology, but using it uh, in in the, in the mouse. So this is a uh, an actually uh, a 32 plex kit that we use, and you can see the um, the receptor knockout on top, the receptor antagonist on bottom, and again they completely flip. Um, so uh, interfering gamma as well as the interfering gamma associated chemokines, 6CL9 and 6CL10 were both significantly lower in the receptor knockouts, which again correlated with the more improved asthma or the better lung physiology, whereas in the receptor antagonists, these were all significantly exacerbated, much, much higher levels uh, of these in the uh, receptor knockout. And so one question that we had was, you know, is this a targetable pathway? Can we modulate this? It kind of goes back to when I introduced the, the biologics and how, how, you know, the asthma therapeutically as a field, we have a lot of biologic target type two. Can we develop therapeutics or are there therapeutics already developed? Um, that, that we can employ to, to, to target different pathways. And so this is uh, Kinneret or Anakinner, which is actually human recombinant IL-1 receptor antagonist. This is not um, a biologic per se, but it is a recombinant protein that we got from uh, that we got from SOBI. And so this is basically looking at lung function. Can we administer this therapeutic? Uh, this is actually approved for other inflammatory uh, diseases, um, but not for asthma, but can we administer this and, uh, and, and affect uh, or improve lung function. And indeed we can. The top is actually a really low dose of Anakinra. Uh, so this is 10 milligram per kilogram. You can see a little, I mean, it's significant, but that's not really a, a dramatic change in lung function. It's, it's lower, but it's not dramatic. But if you increase this fivefold uh, to 50 milligrams per kilogram, you do see quite a, uh, an improvement in, in, uh, in airway function um, in, in the mice that received the, uh, the uh, Anakinra. And so if you look at the immune response in these animals, what you do see is actually there on the bottom, uh, by blocking the IL-1 receptor signaling, uh, we did not have any effect on the type 2 response, but we did have an effect on both the type 1 response, which is the interfering 6CL9 graph there on the left, and also IL-17, so the type 17 responses on the right uh, were significantly lower in mice that received antikinra. So it does appear that this pathway is targetable, at least in experimental asthma. Obviously, we have to do more studies in humans, but this is definitely something that I think could improve the severity of the disease. All right, so finally, another um, mediator. See how we're doing on time, okay? Um, another mediator that, that, we, um, that we also found was CX3CL1. So this is also known as fractalkin. Um, we, uh, what, what I'm not showing here is that I'm not showing any of the, of the sputum data, but fractalkin was, was also elevated in sputum from fungal positive human asthmatics. And so we wanted to interrogate the role of uh, fractalkin. So these are mice that are deficient in the receptor for fractalkin, so 6 3 cr one deficient animals. We expected these mice to probably have improved asthma if, these, uh, if, if this pathway was driving some type of um, inflammatory you know, chemotactic event. I mean, it is a chemokine. Um, but much to our surprise, actually the opposite is true. These mice actually have uh, worse asthma. So uh, when you don't have uh, the receptor, when you don't have uh, CX3CL1 signaling or fractalkin signaling, actually the mice do do poor. They have worse asthma. Uh, and you can see here the wild type and the, uh, and the, the fractalkin receptor knockouts. Um, again, uh, doesn't take a pathologist to see that that's a pretty bad uh, lung there, the airway is completely occluded, lots of inflammation all over the place. And so again, you know, another very, very strong physiological phenotype and histological phenotype um, that can really provide us some answers as to what's going on from the immunological or immunopathogenesis perspective. And so we did just that. And so it turns out, uh, you know, based on our IL-1 studies, you know, we knew that, that neutrophils are likely uh, a pathogenic component in this uh, in this airway disease, the, the fungal-associated um, allergic airway inflammation, uh, and indeed they're significantly higher in the uh, in the in the fractalkin receptor knockouts. Uh, IL-17 is also dramatically higher. GCSF again, we show this in the IL-1 receptor antagonist. 
These are all higher. Uh, the chemicons that we, that we usually look at uh, as far as recruitment of uh, neutrophils to the lung were elevated. And then just inflammation in general, TNF, IL-1 alpha, IL-1 beta, those were all also elevated in these uh, fractocon uh, deficient animals, fractocon receptor deficient animals. So really a, a heightened, really, really heightened inflammatory uh, response. But it's not just restricted to um, neutrophils. It turns out the type 2 and the eosinophils are also elevated. So uh, eosinophils up on the top left graph were also significantly increased. IL-5 was uh, slightly higher. I mean, you know, it's, it's a log scale. It's not a huge difference, but IL-5 is obviously critical for eosinophil survival. So, um, so that's elevated. Um, CCL11, which is the common chemicon for, uh, for recruiting eosinophils, actually was not different. Uh, the type 2 cytokines, IL-4 trended higher. IL-13 was higher. Uh, CCL5, which in some scenarios can also promote um, eosinophil recruitment, was elevated. Um, but some of the other proallergic markers that we've looked at in the past that can be modulated uh, in, in, in asthma severity or fungal asthma severity, in the bottom right, IL-33, CCL-17, and CCL-22 were not modulated um, in the absence of the fractal con receptor. We also looked at uh, type one, again, because uh, you know, we think this could be playing a role, at least based on our data from the IL-1 receptor and IL-1 receptor antagonist uh, story. We think that, that, that type one responses also contribute to asthma severity. And once again, you see that these appear to be exacerbated to a certain degree. Um, we um, look at inflammatory monocyte levels. Uh, those are significantly increased. They're not as high as uh, on a per cell number as eosinophils and neutrophils, but they are elevated. Um, the classic chemokine that recruits um, inflammatory monocytes is uh, CCL2. We actually did not see uh, any differences uh, to explain uh, the increase in the inflammatory monocyte numbers in the fractal con receptor knockouts. But we did see a little bit higher levels of MCSF, which could be a stabilization or, or um, you know, generation factor for these, uh, these cell types. There's some data out there suggesting that that both GMCSF and MCS are critical for the survival of inflammatory monocytes. And so that could be an explanation. We're not, we're not hundred percent sure about that, but that could be a possibility of, that could explain why the, uh, the inflammatory monocytes are, are, are elevated in these, uh, in these animals. Um, so obviously with everything really kind of being haywire in these mice and it was, uh, you know, significantly inflamed at, at, at multiple levels, type one, type two, type 17, Type 17, you would think that maybe something's wrong with their anti-inflammatory mechanisms. And so we looked at a variety of those and really didn't find anything. Um, you know, we did uh, Tregs up on the left, not really any differences there. IL-10 was uh, significantly higher rather than significantly lower. We didn't see anything um, anything there. IL-35 and IL-38 are both, um, you know, starting to become a little bit more appreciated uh, as an immunoregulatory cytokine, so immunoregulatory factors. Um, that are uh, that, that could potentially regulate the, the magnitude of inflammation uh, in, in a variety of diseases as well as asthma. Not a ton of data known about these in asthma, but uh, but people are starting to look at them, and as you can see, they're not really different either. So, um, whatever the you know, I'm sure there's other mechanisms we could look at, you know, uh, TGF beta and things like that. But um, but in general, you know, at least you know some of the more prevalent um, anti-inflammatory mechanisms were actually not affected by the absence of fractal con receptor signaling. And so right now we're still not completely clear exactly what the mechanism is of this of this dysregulation. You know, wh why does fractal con signaling, uh, you know, result, or why, why does the lack of fractal con signaling result in this really hyper-inflammatory response and, and worse, uh, worse fungal asthma? Um, one thing that you might have recognized is if you look at the fractal con receptor knockouts, they actually look very, very close to the IL-1 receptor antagonist knockouts. Both of these mice have really bad um, uh, airway hyperreactivity, and they have obviously a lot of inflammation, um, which would suggest that maybe this mechanism is associated with uh, maybe a lack of IL-1 receptor antagonist. Unfortunately, that was not the case. Actually, IL-1 receptor antagonist was increased in these mice, which actually marries well with the high IL-1 beta, IL-1 uh, alpha uh, data because those were elevated in these mice. And usually in that scenario, IL-1 receptor antagonist is also induced as a check and balance for IL-1 uh, signaling. But so that's not the mechanism here. We were kind of hoping it was, but that ended up not being uh, something that we could uh, we could hang the hat on. So, so to switch gears a little bit here on the last uh, few slides, um, 
you know, one thing that we've gotten interested in over the last several years is um, chitin. Uh, and so chitin, you know, after uh, cellulose is the second most, you know, common uh, compound or molecule really you know, in the environment. Um, you know, it's a major component of a fungal cell wall, including aspergillus. Uh, insects, so house dust mite is a common uh, allergic asthma allergen. Uh, cockroaches in that is a um, is also an allergic asthma allergen. Uh, chitin is very prevalent in the in the uh, in the exoskeletons of these animals. Um, you know, crab and crawfish and shrimp and things like that all have chitin in their cell walls. Um, and so, basically, you know, we've we've developed um, over time, you know, enzymes that are used to 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 break these things down. These are called chitinases. And then we have uh, other things called chitinase-like proteins that can bind chitin, but actually uh, do not have any enzymatic activity, uh, and they, um, but they can bind and uh, you know sequester or block, if you will, uh, you know chitin reactivity. And so basically, in the blue, uh, there's two known uh, mammalian chitinases: acidic mammalian chitinases, or acidic, acidic mammalian chitinase, and then chitotriosinase. These are the two that are known to have enzymatic activity and can actually break down chitin. And then there's quite a few of other chitinase-like proteins. Probably the most well-recognized one in asthma is uh, YKL40, uh, which again does not have the enzymatic activity, but can bond to uh, can bond to, uh, to chitin. And so we got interested in this because, well, for one, we were already interested in, you know, beta glucans in the fungal cell wall and how their recognition could drive immunopathogenesis or drive severity of disease. That was the very first paper that we did, and that was the first thing that I showed at the start of the talk. Um, and so we speculated that there were other things in the fungal cell wall that were also immunoreactive and could also potentially drive uh, pathogenesis. And uh, chitin was obviously uh, one of those. And so if you look at chitin and asthma, there's actually, it's not as many papers as you would think per se, I probably, you know, a couple hundred, you know, maybe not even that high. Um, but chitin really is a buzzword in asthma pathogenesis. And, um, you know, this is just a handful that, I, that I've thrown out uh, here, probably need to update this list, but this is just a handful of, uh, of papers that are kind of re related chitin to pathogenesis of, uh, of asthma, uh, or at least, um, um, you know, some airway hyperactivity disease, if you will. However, you really have to dig into these papers to really understand what they're, what they're testing. And it turns out um, they might not be as thorough as they, as, they, as they, you know, portray, you know, and you can see here in the blue that, you know, some of these are really not testing, uh, you know, um, you know, chitin per se, maybe they're, you know, adding it onto an, another asthma model, like for example, OVA. Um, you know, there's a couple of these papers that actually give um, uh, chitin uh, coated beads. Uh, some of these only give it once or twice and then analyze airway function and, um, you know, inflammatory, you know, mechanisms and things like that. But it's not really a chronic administration. You know, an asthma by definition is, is a chronic disease and it's a chronic exposure. So, so, you know, getting, um, you know, in, in, you know interp interpreting these results from the standpoint of these very acute challenges might not be as, as, as simple or as, as robust as it would be have these challenges done, you know, in a much more chronic you know, fashion like we do for our, our fungal asthma model with aspergillus. Um, so we had shown uh, in one of our earlier papers, this was going on 15 years ago now, so this is just a cartoon of the fungal cell wall and all the different carbohydrates and things that make up this cell wall you can see that the, the bulk of the cell wall, probably 60% of it, is, is made up of these fungal beta glucans. So that's the green and the blue and green kind of interspersed all over uh, that fungal cell wall. And then in the pink circles are actually uh, chitin. So these are the, the chitin parameters. And you can see that these are, you know, relatively deeper buried, if you will, kind of in the, uh, in the fungal cell wall. Um, and what we had shown a few years ago with, with beta glucans is that these actually become unmasked. And so if you take aspergillus and just culture it in vitro and then stain for fungal beta glucan you can actually see that early on you know two hours you get a kind of a pump tape staining not a whole lot and then by the time they start to swell uh, these canidia we actually call them swollen canidia they're, they're significantly swollen and, and round and, and probably four to five times larger um, you can see that the beta glucans are act actually very easily exposed once these organisms start to hyphenate uh, by 10 hours um, again, very high levels of beta glucan exposure. But then by the time they fully hyphenate and they turn into these, these yeti like structures, the mycelium, you can see they're still beta glucan positive, but at a much lower level than they were earlier. So these 
beta-glucan moieties become unmasked over time, and then they essentially remask or downregulate or whatever they do uh, to where they're not as, um, as exposed. And so we speculated that because chitin was so deep in the cell wall of, of, of fungi that this was probably going to happen similarly to what it does for beta-glucans. And indeed, that's exactly what does happen. So if you look at uh, uh, specific, uh, you know, things that stain chitin, so wheat germ gluten, and, and this is a reagent called calcifold white, uh, this is over a you know, relatively short period of time, zero to eight hours. Um, you can see that by the time they hyphenate up to uh, eight, eight to 10 hours here, you can see a Nice chitin stain. You don't really see that early on in the zero to two hour. You know, the calcifor white was a little bit more sensitive um, in detecting the uh, the, uh, the chitin moieties and the aspergillus cell wall. You can see the blue at the bottom, how they there appears to uh, you know start out roughly around two hours, and really it's kind of going pretty good by eight hours. You can see the chitin um, um, emerging from the uh, from the cell wall, if you will, as these organisms go through metabolic and biochemical um, um, changes. And so, uh, you know, we became interested in chitin, um, and this is a paper that we published about two years ago, actually looking at, at AMCase or acidic mammalian chitinase. And uh, what we would expect is that, you know, having the inability to break down chitin would result in some type of uh, maybe accumulation of that to where chitin would be in the airways for a longer period of time and would provoke an immune response, you know, essentially make asthma worse. And we, uh, we actually did not see that at all. We actually saw the opposite in that mice that are deficient in acetic mammalian chitinase actually have better lung function, so they have lower airway resistance. Immunologically, there was not a lot to really um, uh, focus on. We did see some of the pro-allergic chemokines that we constantly look at were lower, and uh, probably the most, the most uh, uh, fitting thing was that lower IL-17A and IL-22, the type 17 responses, were... Um, were lower. Um, you know, we didn't see really any changes in the type one responses or really any differences in type one or the type twos uh, uh, in these mice. And you know, you can see in the airways a uh, little, little bit, um, you know, less inflammation as far as cellularity, um, as well as some of the mucus production and, and things like that. Um, but kind of opposite of what we what we expected. Um, so you know, we're in the process of kind of verifying the chitin accumulation and things like that in these mice. And, and looking at that, but it did not appear that uh, that the lack of breaking down chitin, at least by this one uh, chitinase, did not. Uh, you know, it was actually um, more um, pathogenic, if you will, to have this thing expressed than than to not have it. Um, so we also got interested in uh, YKL40 in mice. This is called BRP39, uh, and one of the reasons why we got interested in this is kind of going back to our human asthmatic. Uh, profile, the biomarkers that we looked uh, at, uh, YKL40 was one of the ones that was on that 96 uh, mediator panel, and it was elevated, actually, in human asthmatics that were fungal um, positive, uh, suggesting maybe that the RP39 uh, is an aminopathogenic factor in um, uh, in human, human fungal asthma as well as potentially experimental fungal asthma. So we wanted to interrogate that. Um, and once again, you know, this is where science gets really exciting. You think something's going to happen, the opposite happens, and it happens routinely and reproducibly, and then you're like, okay, this is definitely something that needs to be pursued. And so we we got mice that are deficient in this chitinase-like protein, BRP39, um, and you can see that uh, almost like the fractal con receptor knockouts, almost like the IL-1 receptor antagonist knockouts, these mice have much worse asthma, much higher airway resistance, so their airway physiology is, is worse. And so we start ticking off the boxes and saying, okay, what are the mechanisms here? This is probably going to be immunological. Let's start going through. Uh, actually, one of the first things that we looked at based on some of the literature uh, uh, searches with BRP39, which is actually not widely um, investigated in asthma. There's a couple of papers on ovalbumin and a couple of papers on house dust mite um, that show that this uh, actually, um, uh, the, the mice that are deficient in BRP39 actually do better. They have less severe asthma in those allergen models. So actually completely opposite ours. Um, and so one of the first things we ask is what about mucus production? Maybe that's different between these mice. Uh, it turns out it doesn't look like it, at least histologically. You can look at the airway there with the purple staining and roughly looks the same between wild type and knockout. We actually uh, quantified this by looking at uh, MUC5AC and GOB5 or, or, or CLCA um, expression. And you can see there's really no difference. This is just real-time PCR measurements. 
of these in whole lung. We didn't really see any differences in the mucus production. Um, another thing that we uh, don't normally look at, but did in this case was pulmonary edema in that maybe these mice have more edema. Um, and so that's what's driving their airway hyperreactivity. Um, and you can see that that does not really be the case. It's actually the opposite. They have less pulmonary edema, even though they have worse uh, fungal asthma. Um, uh, even actually at the baseline, even in naive mice, they seem to have a lower wet to, wet to dry um, lung weight. Uh, and so um, so they, the pulmonary demon does not appear to be a potential mechanism. So what about the um, inflammation or the immune responses? And as you can see um, here, um, uh, if you look in the, uh, in the in, in, this is just H&E stained lungs, you can see that uh, really not a massive difference, maybe a little bit less of inflammatory cells in the um, in the, uh, in the uh, BRP39 uh, deficient animals, but uh, not a whole lot of difference. We actually did flow on these on these animals to identify the cell populations. Uh, actually neutrophils, which we always have thought of are pathogenic in, in fungal asthma, were trended lower, but were not significant. We did find lower eosinophils and we did find lower CD4 T cells. Um, so again, completely not what we would expect based on the lung physiology. BRP39 deficient animals have worse airway hyperreactivity. We expected that to correlate with a higher cellularity and higher inflammation, not lower, because we've seen these correlates in our previous couple of data sets that I've, that I've already shown you, but these are actually lower. If you go into type one, type two, type 17, and phenotype all of these responses, type one, type 17, no difference at all. Type two, lower, actually uh, significantly lower, four, five, 33, the chemokines that we always look at, um, all of these are lower. So really, really confusing data. I mean, this really does not make sense based on the airway uh, hyperreactivity. Um, and so, you know, it, we cannot really, you know, at this point call this immunopathogenic because there's nothing that's really going haywire in these animals to explain why this, this um, airway hyperreactivity is, is so high. Um, we've started looking at some of the anti-inflammatory mechanisms. Again, maybe they're, you know, dysregulated somehow. That doesn't appear to be the case. Again, IL-10, TGF-8 is actually lower. IL-38 uh, actually is higher in these animals. Um, and maybe, you know, that could explain why some of the type 2 responses are lower because IL-38 is a negative regulator of those. That might explain it. But again, that does not explain why the lung physiology uh, in these mice is so much higher and so much worse. So again, not really any major immune correlates that can explain this. And so the next thing that we did is, well, maybe we can isolate the function of BRP39 in a cell type or, or, or you know, a group of cells that will help us understand, you know, what could be going on. And so we did what they call bone marrow chimeras, where you irradiate mice and then you give them back, you know, bone marrow either from the same mouse or different mouse. Uh, to basically isolate BRP39 expression either in the immune or the hematopoietic compartment or in the non-immune or non-hematopoietic compartment. And so we did this, and unfortunately, it did not reveal uh, anything completely uh, clear. It turns out that if you have BRP39 expressed either in an immune cell or in a non-immune cell, such as an airway epithelial cell or an airway smooth muscle cell, that's sufficient to protect the animal from airway hyperactivity. And so uh, we have all the groups here, all the controls and whatnot. You can see that knockout into knockout, which is just, a, you know, BRP is not expressed anywhere. Really bad, you know, airway hyperactivity, really bad asthma. And then if you actually knock it out in either the immune or the non-immune department. Um, so that, you know, did not help us narrow down potential uh, mechanisms to explain this. Um, and so where we're at now is, you know, one thing, you know, that we try to do in a lot of our research is try to, you know, look at this from a therapeutic targeting standpoint. Um, we figured, you know, well, let's see, let's just see if we can treat mice, just normal mice, rather than the knockout with BRP39, uh, and um, let's see if we can modulate uh, the severity of, of fungal asthma. And this is a this is a preliminary study we just did. We have another one coming off actually tomorrow, I think. Um, looking at this, and so these are just normal wild type mice that are uh, that have asthma that are treated with BRP39, uh, and it does appear that we can actually lessen disease severity. Um, by treating with this uh, this chitinase-like uh, protein. We don't know what the mechanism is. Um, chances are it's not gonna be immune-based based on our knockout data, but at, at the very least, this gives us another avenue to pursue from the standpoint of, 
of uh, what is really going on in these animals uh, as far as uh, how BRP39 functions to protect against the severity of uh, experimental fungal asthma. So just to wrap up, last slide or two and everything, I, I think what I wanted to convey here is that we actually were, uh, you know, uh, really a basic science mouse lab, and we had the opportunity to look into humans and try to get some, some biomarkers, and we used Luminex technology to do this, to get biomarkers uh, that we could really, you know, do the, rather than the, the bench to bedside, we actually did bedside to bench and got the human data uh, to tell us what we needed to go back and look at in the mouse model. And as you can see, this is just some of the data that's fallen out of this. And we've kind of broadly broken these down that, you know, some of these pathways, um, you know, are immunopathogenic. We actually speculated uh, that anything that was elevated in a human um, would correlate to, you know, would be immunopathogenic, would be bad. It turns out we're, that's not the case. So IL-1 signaling is bad. IL-1 receptor antagonists, remember that was elevated in humans. But actually, you know, you want that to be elevated because without it, uh, asthma gets worse. Uh, AMP case, um, again, uh, expected that to uh, uh, to decrease severity. Actually, uh, it contributes to disease. Uh, BRP39, um, don't know the mechanism, but, uh, and, and again, can't say it's immunoprotective per se, um, but it clearly is required to, to protect the lung from airway hyperactivity. And then I didn't go into the CR3. Uh, that phenotype is obviously not that robust. But the 6 cl one or the fractalcon also, again, an immunoprotective molecule, when you don't have 6 cl one 6 3 cl one signaling, you do get much worse asthma, uh, and, and there's a, there's a hyperinflammatory event that goes on there. And so clearly there's something going on from a regulatory standpoint with, uh, with that. So just to uh, wrap up, the last slide I have here, just thanks all the members of the Steel Lab, former and current, that have worked on these projects. Uh, I was at UAB for 11 years before coming to Tulane two and a half years ago, so I've got a lot of collaborators there. Uh, Man Immune and Pfizer provided a variety of mice, uh, colleagues at Wake Forest and University of Arizona, who are clinical colleagues uh, in our severe asthma research program research. Uh, and then Steve Van Dyken is a new collaborator at Washington University who is an expert in chitin biology, who's helping us uh, figure out some of the mechanisms associated with chitin recognition and chitin accumulation in the lung. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, I'm going to escape out of out of this and go back to the video. It's been a little bit longer than I anticipated, but I think I got through what I wanted to get through. Um, let's see. Yes. You can hear me? Yes, we can okay. hear you, Dr. Steele. Thank you for your informative presentation. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. So if you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. I see we have about three or four in right now. Um, our first question, Dr. Steele, what role does one's epigenetics play in genetic asthma? If so, are there any environmental factors to be mindful of that could possibly decrease one's asthma severity? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, and uh, <laughs> you would think I'd be the perfect person to ask this. And, and I am the first person to say that I am not a geneticist. <laughs> I'm an immunologist. And um, I mean, there there's quite a lot of data on epigenetics and, and the role it plays uh, and definitely environmental, um, you know, factors. Um, as far as, you know, how do we use that from a therapeutic standpoint or a treatment option standpoint, I can't tell you, to be honest with you. Um, it's definitely not my area. It's not an area that we actually look at in, in my lab. Um, but there is some data out there that suggests, you know, that, you know, you know, methylation status and things like that could definitely modulate severity of disease. And so, but, uh, but just to be completely transparent, I'm just not the one to answer the question. Thank you, Dr. Steele. Um, the next question I have coming in, is um, kids' asthma medicine um, equally effective like adults? You know, I'm not a clinician. I don't treat, you know, patients. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess my understanding is, yeah, I mean, you know, obviously I would argue that, you know, we, you know, the clinical trials are more adult slanted, if you will. I mean, um, and so we have more data uh, in adults. Um, you know, we've often wonder, you know, if we were to, you know, model our asthma experimental model in, in a younger mouse versus an older mouse, would that give differences as far as inflammation and things like that? Um, but it does appear, you know, it's it, it's not extremely common to break out a pediatric population from an adult population. Um, 
the Severe Asthma Research Program actually did that. Um, and, and there's some overlaps and there's some distinctions actually between uh, the two populations. But um, but yeah, I, I think if in general, yeah, I think they would they would be efficacious. But I just think the data is much more robust and recognized in the adult population than they are in the uh, in, in the kids population as far as some of the biologic therapeutics, you know, and things like that. Obviously, everybody has an inhaler or, you know, whether you're young or, 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 or old, older, you know, adult, um, as well as, um, you know, uh, oral corticosteroids or inhaled corticosteroids. Those are used pretty regularly in both adults and pediatrics for just regular everyday maintenance of disease. Uh, and so some of these are probably a little bit more wider and, and broader therapeutic efficacy than some of the other targeted therapeutics like the biologics and things like that. Wonderful. And we're going to wrap up with this final question here. Um, as for genetic asthma, do we have a solution? Yeah, actually, this was posted earlier, I think, and I saw it before I started. And um, I, I guess I'm not completely clear on the actual question. I mean, you know, obviously, you know, one of the major um, uh, goals of the SART program, you know, and specifically the Wake Forest uh, site was to um, really phenotype asthma genetically and look at polymorphisms and uh, SNPs and things like that to really understand. And clearly there are definitely, definitely uh, SNPs and all kinds of things that correlate with severity and, you know, things like that. Um, but, you know, do, do we, you know, does that mean that we have a, you know, a therapeutic, um, you know, not specific based on the, on the genetic analysis. I mean, you know, again, it really goes back to our endotyping of the asthma, you know, knowing what your triggers are, uh, you know, really knowing what, type of asthma you have. Is it the type two? Is it the palsy granulocytic? Is it eosinophilic? Knowing those can help us do precision medicine or personalized medicine with the therapeutics that we have. But, you know, there's, you know, biomarkers that are coming out now um, that, you know, might end up being better markers and better targets than we've had uh, in the past. Um, and maybe, you know, could hit more specific types of asthma rather than you know, the broader, you know, type two types. And again, this is really kind of what drives our research is trying to really understand, um, um, you know, some of the biomarkers in disease pathogenesis, uh, specifically the fungi that we can potentially harness and use as a target uh, for further development. Great, thank you. We actually have one more question coming in if you'd like to take it, Dr. Steele. Um, Asthma is an, an immune deficiency, correct? What can one with asthma do in a time like we are in now with COVID that yeah. affects those with compromised immune systems? I guess I don't really consider asthma an immune deficiency per se, because a lot of time it's a hypersensitivity or an allergic reaction. So you could almost think of it as, you know, it's not autoimmune, but it's a hyperactive immune response to whatever you're allergic to. So I wouldn't call it uh, deficiency. Um, as far as, you know, asthma and coronavirus, um, there is an association. It's actually, um, uh, it does appear to be a, a, a comorbidity. It's not as high as some of the other ones that we're seeing diabetes and hypertension. Uh, I know here in Louisiana, we're actually tracking this and roughly uh, for what we could tell about 4% of our coronavirus patients are asthmatics. Um, so a, a low number, but there is some level of a correlation. Um, you know, and there's other lung diseases that, you know, um, that, you know, can be confused with asthma or overlap with asthma, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease is one that has a similarity to asthma as well as a distinction from asthma. You know, and we really, you know, don't know. I mean, I, there's actually some data out there that suggests that if you had asthma and influenza, um, you actually uh, do a little bit better. So asthma is almost, I don't want to say it's protective, but it's actually um, you know, there's something going on, you know, that, that helps with influenza rather than hurts or adds on to disease severity. Now, whether we have that with COVID, I, I don't know. It's something that we would definitely be interested in pursuing. But as of right now, the rates are so low from the standpoint of asthma as a comorbidity, um, you know, it may not be, you know, worth looking at. But it is an interesting question. 
Thank you again, Dr. Steele, for your time today and your important research. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and their interesting questions. I'd also like to thank our sponsor, Luminex, for sponsoring today's webinar. Questions we did not get time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by our speaker via the contact information you provided at the time of your registration. Um, this webcast can also be viewed on demand uh, for six months until March of 2021. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay, and we encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, thank you so much again, Dr. Steele. Goodbye. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you.